Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Is that good? Yeah? Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so, as you said, my name is Ethan Dodge. Um, I'm also known as Chippin on IRC, just like everybody else here has an alias, so do I. So, actually, I was never called Chippin to my face until yesterday, and it was kind of a weird experience for me. So you could go ahead and call me Ethan. I would probably respond better to that anyway. Um, anyway, so the title of my talk was Security Onions and Honeypots. Uh, but now it's just Honeypots, because I really like them a lot, so I'm going to talk about them a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry if you guys came here and you wanted to, to get some Security Onion demos, you wanted to get the lowdown on that. Um, I'd be more than happy to still go over it with any of you guys. You guys can hit me up on Twitter or an IRC anytime, email, um, and I'd be more than happy to, to go over what I was going to go over. Um, I, I love network security monitoring. It's what I do for a living. So, um, so first off, I've got to read this disclaimer just real quick. Uh, views expressed in here are solely mine um, and not the views of my employer or any other organization which I'm associated with. And I am responsible for the content of this presentation. Likewise, the research conducted and illustrated herein was performed by me unless otherwise noted. All right. So I got, um, want to talk about a little bit about the audience that I, that I want to address here. Pretty much, I think those three categories cover everybody. And that's what I really like about honeypots. You don't have to have a ton of experience to get into them. And you could learn a heck of a lot from them. Um, um, so, I, so I'm, talking, I'm talking to the noobs that this is their first security con. B-Sides last year was my very first security con, and I remember I was amazed by, well, I still am, but I just remember my mind being blown by every talk that I listened to at B-Sides last year. I was like, they can do that? No way. Anyway, it's also kind of depressing because it's like, oh, I fight you guys for a living, and yet you're way ahead of me in the game. So anyway... Um, also, those looking to get into the honeypot slash threat intelligence communities and those that may already have experienced honeypotting, um, what I really like is I love talking to other people that have experience with honeypots um, and that do their own research on them because we always bounce ideas off of each other. Um, I always learn something new almost every time I talk to somebody. Um, um, I'm, actually, I'm actually doing some research with a group. Um, that there's, let's see, I think there's like 18, 19 of us, and we're all collectively doing, we have a ton of honeypots collectively, and we're doing research. Um, uh, I think we have about 40 hosts now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. Um, so let's get to it. Honeypots. Um, beware of addiction. If you guys are going to get into this, it is addicting. You could ask my wife. I'm up till I'm up till like four o'clock in the morning almost every night because I'm just lo I'm, I love modifying my honeypots. I love uh, looking at the malware that's coming in, stuff like that. So I thought that that uh, meme was fitting. Um, sometimes I feel like Winnie the Pooh, like get away, give me my honey. So um, <laughs> why honeypots? Why honeypots? Um, how many of you guys? Okay, let's be honest. Do not please. Don't be afraid to ask any questions. Don't be afraid um, to, um, to admit that you don't know something. How many of you guys don't know what a honeypot is? Is there anybody here? You? In the back? Okay. Rob, I know that you know what a honeypot is. <laughs> I, talk to, I talk to you about my honeypots like twice a week. So, um, How many of you guys are skeptical of honeypots and their... And their um, Let's see, how many of you guys are skeptical of honeypots and, and what they can do, if, they can really, if they're really of value? Anybody in the room? Yeah? I know there's quite a few people that don't really think that honeypots are worth it, and I, and I definitely see the point, you know? You stand up, you stand up a, a vulnerable host and somebody gets it, some script kitty gets into it, woo-hoo, like, of course that's gonna happen. They're scanning the internet 24-7. Um, or people like to throw out this reason, threat intelligence, right? Uh, kind of one of the bu buzzwords, and, and yet, yeah, I mean, it's true. Like, who am I to stand up uh, a ton of vulnerable hosts and then say, oh, I'm getting attacked from, the, from this IP with this malware, and you should watch out for it. Like, that's not real threat intelligence, right? That's just some kid having fun and thinking he's awesome. Um, I really like this meme as well. 
Um, Red Intelligence, it's just a stupid RSS feed. Found it on Twitter, I had to do some editing. Um, there was another word in there, I'm sure some of you guys saw it. Um, anyway, uh, it, it, threat intelligence has become one of those buzzwords that you hear, and I'm, I've already said it like 20 times, so I'm sure some of you guys have already taken some drinks. Um, but it's, it, it's almost like cloud and big data, um, heart bleed, you know? There's some more drinks, go for it. Um, anyway, but, it, it's it, um, honeypotting can lead to high integrity threat intelligence if you put time into it and you do it right. Um, the the problem with some of these companies, um, are, are any of you guys familiar with like Norse or CrowdStrike or Mandiant that sell uh, threat intelligence? Um, awesome products, awesome companies. Um, I'd love to work for one of them one day. Um, <laughs> Just throwing that out there. <laughs> anyway, um, they, but, the, but, but part of the problem is, I mean, even with such an awesome product where they, I mean, they have, they have hundreds of hosts all over the internet that are gathering this threat intelligence, but it's, unless you're willing to pay a ton of money, uh, it's never really targeted threat intelligence, right? It's never, it, it's, you, you may have a completely different environment than the environment that they're, that they're um, monitoring, right? Um, and the mal maybe they're may maybe they're selling you Intel for uh, Windows malware, and maybe you got an entire um, Linux environment, you know, or or vice versa, or whatever it may be. It's uh, it's oftentimes very hard to get some tailored intelligence. <laughs> um, this article um, showed up in Dark Reading. It was like two years ago, um, but it was a good. It's a good article. Five reasons why every company should have a honeypot. I, um, and it just goes through and it talks about how um, that you can, like what I was just saying, you can get tailored intelligence. You stand up a host um, that is vulnerable and you could go in there and, and if you do it right and you don't make it obvious that it's a honeypot and they actually try and exploit uh, your network, your, your, um, you could have an entire honey network and have multiple boxes that they could pivot to and exploit and stuff. Um, you're going to be able to see... Um, what kind of attackers are specifically targeting your company, um, or, or whatever it may be, right? And and once and then also, if they are targeting you, you'll be able to see what they do when they get in. What what it, what are they trying to accomplish? Um, now, there. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's tons of cyber criminals out there that don't necessarily have a target. Um, I guess they're not cyber criminals. They're more script kiddies. But then they're just scanning the entire internet, trying to find vulnerable vulnerable boxes and pop as many boxes as they can and then brag about it on Twitter um, and call it hacktivism. But um, thanks for the sympathy laugh, whoever. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, I, I, I would highly recommend a honeypot. Um, so let's go through the different types of honeypots. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard of, of, of Honey Drive? Okay, we got a few in the room. How many of you have actually deployed it? Any of you guys? You, back there? What do you think? It's sweet. What do you What do you like about it? Yeah, that's true. That's very very true. Are, do you have multiple instances of it, or now tell me this? Did you have multiple of the honey pots running at the same time on there, or did you kind of alternate? Just one or the other. See. And that's kind of, uh, honey, honey Drive is really, so hold on, let me tell you what Honey Drive is, first of all. It's a, it's a Linux, they call it a distro, but really it's just Ubuntu with a ton of honeypots pre-installed onto it. Um, and uh, you, you deploy, the, you deploy the, the, the ISO, and it comes pre-installed with Kippo, uh, Dionne, I forget, I don't know how to pronounce that, Honey D, Glasstop F, Con, Conpot, Thug, and it also comes with some visualization um, Applications such as Kippograph, Honey DViz, Dianaway. Uh, I'm sorry, whoever the developer is, I'm totally butchering the name. And Elk Elk Stack. Um, anyway, so my beef with Honey Drive is it's super super good if you're just um, trying to get into the scene, and 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 that's probably who um, who they tailored it towards were were people like that. But if you have if you have port 22 and port 80 and port 443 and port 123 and port 53, 
open, all open on one IP address and they're all exploitable and they're super easy to get into, they're gonna know that they're in a honeypot, right? <laughs> they, so so you're ne they, realistically, you're never gonna run every single one of those at the same time. And honestly, um, like I said, it's an Ubuntu distro, so a lot of RAM is taken on, it's running on X Ubuntu, and a lot of RAM is being taken up by the, by the desktop environment. Um, my personal favorite um, that of the, on that list is Kippo, um, and I'm running Kippo on some boxes that only have 256 meg of RAM. I've been tinkering with the idea of running, of trying to get it to run, excuse me, on, on some boxes that only have 128 megs of RAM. I was talking to the developer and he said that that would be pushing, pushing it a little, but uh, I, I, I wanna try it nonetheless. So Honey Drive, I would recommend it if you're trying to get in the scene because like he said, all the hard work is done. It kind of, the, all the honey pots are installed. You just gotta do uh, dot slash start dot, dot sh and there you go. So, um, so there are low interaction and high interaction honey pots. Um, and each have their purposes. Um, low interaction is typically a simulation. Um, it's probably like a virtual environment um, with incomplete functionality. Um, for instance, if you hop on, and we're gonna go over a lot of this here in a little bit, but you won't be able to run all the commands uh, that you normally would be able to on if it was a Windows host or a Linux host or whatever it is. Um, you can't, can't really be used to exploit um, other vulnerabilities because you don't have a whole lot of functionality in there unless they learn how to pop the honey, unless they know that they're in a honey pot and then they learn how to pop the honey pot, then your host is screwed, right? Um, then they could take over that whole network. Anyway, um, used to observe behavior, right? So a script kitty gets in, he downloads some malware, you could go in and you could reverse, reverse engineer that malware. Um, uh, there were a couple of really good malware talks at this conference that I went to. Um, I would highly recommend going back and looking at them. Um, I, I've recently gotten into malware analysis, however, I'm still such a noob at it, um, but the, those talks got me really excited about it. Um, so uh, an example of a low interaction honeypot would be Kippo. Um, um, and then there's also high interaction, where high interaction is an actual machine. They're going to have full capability, um, and somehow you're either like tapping the line of all the, and getting all the traffic that's going to that box or that you have some sort of proxy that's uh, decrypting the traffic if it's encrypted or just picking it up and logging it all and then sending it back to you somehow. Um, a lot, I, I haven't seen a ton of these developed uh, unless it's like, I would imagine if it was like in-house, like a, like a big enterprise, they, they threw out, they uh, duplicated their web server and then just tapped the line and made that, uh, that particular IP address vulnerable and, and whatnot. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can go about doing it. Um, they're used to observe targeted attacks. You're gonna get a lot higher uh, integrity threat intel um, from, from that, um, and they're not supposed to be easily detectable. Um, and a, one example is uh, of one that actually, it, it's in alpha testing right now. It's called Bifrost. I was really hoping to try and get it deployed before B-Sides so I can uh, talk a little bit about it, but I have not been able to yet. Um, but I will probably blog about it when I do, so um, if you guys want to check that out. But. Um, so Kippo, let's go over Kippo. Like I said, this is, this is the one that I'm running. I currently have five hosts running Kippo. I had six, but then one completely got hosed and I didn't have time to get it back up and running before B-Sides. Um, and it was not because I got pwned, it just, the hard drive failed. I was running it on my home network. By the way, if you run it on your home network, I was actually running Honey Drive, so maybe Honey Drive did it. Anyway, if you run it on your home network, make sure you firewall that sucker and make, make sure that it cannot get out to your actual home network because that would be very bad. I would recommend Indian Firewall or PFSense. Anyway, Kippo is a medium interaction SSH honeypot designed to log brute force attacks and most importantly, the entire shell interaction performed by the attacker. Um, that's straight from the, GitHub, uh, the Kippo GitHub. Um, like it says, it logs the entire shell um, session right there, and it sends it back to you in a log. There are several um, tools that you could use for visual visualization that will kick back the logs to you and show you exactly what the attacker did, um, and you could see if it tried to download any malware or if he tried to download an entire Windows ISO and just totally hosed your entire machine. If you're running small on small boxes, that 
which has happened to me before. So um, anyway, so how Kippo works. Um, is anybody here familiar with Kippo? How many of you have, have used Kippo? You too? Okay. Um, are you guys familiar with how it works? Yeah. So basically, Kippo just runs in a virtual Python environment, um, and it simulates a Debian, I think it's a Debian 5 or maybe Debian 6 box, um, and, and it's, uh, it's programmed to respond to the basic Linux commands, such as ls, ping, ifconfig, uname, uh, ps, uh, all your basic sysadmin stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's programmed to respond to that, but the problem is all the outputs of that command, of all of those commands are static. And so it's really easy to tell if it's Kippo. They're just sitting, they're just sitting in a file that the script calls and just outputs that file, right? Um, so, so it, and we'll get into how easy it is to detect. Also, you could, um, it, it depends on a file called the fs.pickle file, which is what simulates the file, the Debian file system, and you can create your own fs.pickle file um, pretty easily. I, I, I did mine in like two minutes, um, and I'll go over how to do that too. Um, okay, so how to detect Kippo. This is, these are some fun, interesting examples. So you'll see here in the top, the top right, um, you'll see that the server prompt, the, the command prompt is root at server 03. That is the prompt for Kippo right out of the box. So if you do not change anything, um, it, the Kippo is so widespread and it, there's so many hosts on it on the internet that anybody's going to log in, see root at server 03, and they're going to hop right out. Like, that is the first thing that I would change if I were you. Um, um, also, you'll see below that, I was able to ping 999.999.999.999, and it somehow re resolved to 236.203. Um, so, um, and you'll also notice that I actually, I had the count flag on there to only send three packets, it sent six. So, until I, and I actually had to stop it, I think there's a control C somewhere in there. Um, anyway, um, and then also, I have config, so it was actually Metacortex that pointed this out to me. Um, if you do an I, so you'll see here, I did an IF config twice, and those of you who aren't familiar with IF config, it, it, it shows you your network status, your IP address, uh, your MAC address, um, and um, here at the bottom, um, it, uh, it has the RX bytes and, bytes and TX bytes, and if you're logged in via SSH to a box, if you did IF config twice, those should change, but you'll see they haven't, so. That's also a super easy way. There's a ton of other easy ways to, and, and we'll talk a little bit about it as it goes on. There's several Metasploit, um, um, Metasploit modules that will detect it before the user even logs in, before login. Um, I'm not, so I'm not nearly smart enough to know how exactly that works. Um, a friend of mine, Andrew Morris, um, he does a lot of work with Kippo, and he actually wrote the most recent one, um, and it, it, that one has since been patched. Um, I was going to pull up his blog article uh, about that, but his blog is down for some reason, so when it comes back up, I'll tweet it out or something. Um, uh, yeah. So there's some really, really simple ways to hide Kippo, make it less detectable. Um, like I said, the first thing I do is I change that host name. Um, add a login banner. So when I first deployed Kippo and I was getting ready, and it, it was the first time, um, and I was trying to gather all this data and research, I just deployed it right out of the box. I didn't change anything, just default settings. I didn't have a single, I, well, I had some successful logins, but they, they logged in and then hopped right back out, right? They didn't even run any commands because it was so obvious that it was a Kippo box. I added a login banner, changed the host name. Like, within an hour, I had, um, I had, I, I had scripted uh, malware attacks coming in. Um, and they were trying to download all this stuff, and it's really cool. So, um, so the, just those two, uh, while they're st it's still not going to be incredibly high integrity um, malware or threat intel, uh, they, they do a lot. Um, edit the user db.txt. The user db.txt file is what Kippo depends on for the credentials. <laughs> right out of the box, it accepts, well, depending on what fork you pull from, um, but the original one accepted only root as the username, and then one, two, three, four, five, six as the password. Um, then 
the most the most commonly used fork of Kippo now um, accepts anything but that combination. Um, that's also a super easy way to detect if you're in a honey box if it accepted two different credentials for the same user <laughs> or two different passwords for the same user. That's that's a red flag, right? Change the file system. So there's a really there's a really awesome script called createfs.py. Um, basically, um, so, and 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 it, it will take any mounted uh, any mounted hard drive, any mounted file system, and it will create the fs.pickle file out of it. So I just spun up an Ubuntu VM that was serving up some DNS um, and ran that script, and I had a new fs.pickle file, and all of a sudden my Kippo instance was, uh, was simulating an Ubuntu box and not a Debian box. Um, that could do a lot. Um, how, however, it is, and I'll get into this, it's arguable if changing the file system is really what um, is, is really helps you because so much of it is scripted. Um, edit the Etsy password and the Etsy shadow files, um, and edit the script output, edit the IF config output, edit the PS uh, output. That's another thing, the PS output is, is uh, um, static, and we all know that the PS output should be changing if your processes are always ending and running and everything, so. Um, okay, so this is, this is the exciting part here. Um, I'm gonna go into my findings, what I've found. Um, like I said, I have been running um, five Kippo boxes for a couple of months now. Well, I spun some of them up at different times, but I've been doing it for a little bit here. Um, I, I, I just find really cheap hosting, really cheap VPS, and I buy it and then I just, I throw Kippo on it and, uh, and then make, make my modifications and, then, and observe. So I have, I have two in the United States, two in Canada, and one in Europe. Um, and these are my two, two boxes, they're both in LA. Um, you'll see that the top graph, so, the, oh, so th these are graphs of login attempts versus login successes. The blue is login attempts. The yellow is login successes. There's a whole lot more blue than yellow, right? Um, so you'll see the top one, ha this, is, this is over the past 30 days, so from, uh, I pulled these last night at like two in the morning, or this morning at like two in the morning. Um, and uh, you'll see um, that it's had, the top one has had 519 total attempts and 10 successes, and the bottom one has had 3,924 total attempts and two successes. Uh, does that seem high or low to you guys? Low, why does it seem low? Who said that? What do you, why, why is that low? Yeah, so I'm not gonna lie, and I don't know what at the. I haven't done. I haven't had enough time to do enough research to know exactly why it, those two boxes are getting the data. That I've, maybe they've. I don't know. Maybe there's some underground community, and they they've been flagged as. Uh, <laughs> they've been flagged as honeypots, and so they, I doubt that's the case. Anyway, um, but uh, so the, um, the bottom one. There's only two. There's only two successes though, and there's a reason for that. Um, so I changed the credentials on the one in the bottom uh, graph, the one that had the least amount of, of successful logins. So the, so the top graph, I just left it at the default, root, one, two, three, four, five, six, and they get in, and it, a lot of times that's a red flag for people, it's like, oh, that's definitely a honeypot if it's that easy to get into. Actually, you never know. <laughs> so um, I, I know there's tons of sysadmins in here that know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the bottom one, I changed it to only accept a 14-character password for the root user. 14-character password, how hard is that to crack? It's crazy, crazy hard, unless, um, unless you do something. Uh, I, I, my boss is actually really, really good at password cracking, and he's cracked, I think he claims to have cracked 16-character passwords and whatnot. Um, anyway, um, so I actually, I, you'll see it says I leaked the, the password there. Um, what I did is I leaked the, the 14 character password uh, to the honeypot on Pastebin um, just to see what, ha what, what, what would happen. Um, I was just really curious. I had a buddy do the same thing. Um, and you'll see that's the format that I did it in. I just listed the IP, listed the user, listed the password, and just and threw some leet language in there and pretended like I was a hacktivist that, that just pwned this box or whatever. And uh, um, so I posted that at 1.14 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Any guesses as to how long it took 
and, and before I saw a login? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Wow, who said that? That is, that is. Okay, what else? Any other guesses? 20 seconds? Wow, you guys, wow. You guys have, um, the, the, so I will say this, that in under two minutes, the, um, the pastebin had over 100 views. Um, and that's just because there's so many bots mining pastebin for credentials, right? Um, so you guys, actually, I thought, I didn't know anyone was going to guess as fast as you guys did, but at two hours and 35 minutes, I thought that was crazy fast um, that I saw a successful login. And you know, I, so I saw it at 349 from a Romanian IP address that had malicious intent. With a 14-character password logging into a box with malicious intent, you know that they saw that link on Facebook. There's no way that they cracked it. And it just so happens that they cracked it two hours and 35 minutes after, um, I, after I posted that. And that was the first time I'd ever seen that IP come, come at any of my boxes. Um, like, I, that, that, that slide is wrong. I, it's, it had over 100 views in two minutes. Um, I saw five uh, different logins from three distinct IP addresses over the course of 12 hours. And then I didn't see any more until just like last week. I got two more logins to that box. Um, uh, but the, so the, the other two IP addresses, they were just, they had like no malicious intent. They just hopped on the box and were like, yeah, look at me. I'm so awesome. I'm on a box, I'm on somebody else's box, you know? So I made this meme in their honor. <laughs> Whoever you guys are, that's, that's what I think of you. Um, <laughs> Just kidding, I'm sure you're great people. Okay, so the, this, this, excuse me. <clears throat> the, these are my stats, uh, login attempts versus successes in the past 30 days on two boxes that I have in Canada. What, first off, what stands out to, uh, in those two graphs to you guys? Boom, yeah. And that is what we call a hosting problem. <laughs> you get what you pay for, cloud at cost. It's super cheap, but you get what you pay for, right? Um, so these boxes were actually seeing super steady attacks. And, and so, le, so rather than this being 30-day data, this is more like 15-day data um, or so. I, I didn't look exactly. But anyway, the top one had two, 255,000 attempts with 79 um, successes, and the bottom one had 282,000 with zero successes. Um, and there's a reason for the zero success one. Um, uh, and that, and the, are these more the, who, who said that you wouldn't expect that low on my other American boxes? Yeah. Is this kind of what you would expect for, for total attempts and successes and whatnot? Yeah. This, I mean, there are, there, like I said, there are people from all over the world, not, it, believe it or not, it doesn't just happen in China. It happens elsewhere. <laughs> uh, yes? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. That actually type in a password, uh, username and a password. Um, if I did scans, oh my gosh, the number would be way bigger than this, way bigger. Um, I think last I checked, uh, one of my honeypots was like averaging like 40,000 scans a day or something like that. Um, I, I could get that data for you. Um, so yeah, these are actual, when I say login attempts, they actually enter a username and a password and it either succeeded or it failed. Um, so anyway, um, so let's take a look at why I saw more logins on one than the other. So I changed the user db.txt on one, and the one on the top graph, I, I, I set it to only re to reject the top 100 passwords that I got from a buddy, uh, to, um, DA667 on Twitter, if you guys are familiar with him. Um, he, he lent me that, and, uh, um, and then co combined with the top 10 usernames. So any combination of those 100 passwords and 10 usernames, it just rejected it. Um, but anything else, it would take. So I'm kind of running a so I'm running a risk there because it's possible to log in as the same user with two different passwords, right? So that, um, but I mean, I'm just doing research, trying to see what kind of data I get, see what different behaviors give me, what different actions give me, what different behaviors and whatnot. Um, so the other one only accepts a seven-character password um, from five different usernames. So it's I, I think the usernames are like root FTP. Um, and like John and Bob or something like that. I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I could go in and look. But it's a seven character password. I had a five, I had like a six character password on another box and it was cracked in like, in like four days. Um, but this one is yet to be cracked. Um, I actually leaked 
a keylogger dump um, of, an, of, a, of a VM that I just span up, spun up, um, SSHing into this honeypot, and, it, and so it, the keylogger had the creds in there, and I leaked that on pastebin rather than explicitly um, saying, hey, these are the creds to this IP address. I just did the keylogger dump just to see what I get. I dumped that this morning at 7.53. Still haven't seen um, anything. Um, but I definitely will either tweet or blog about it when I do. Um, also on these two boxes, I ch this is where I changed the FS pickle, the story that I told you that I spun up a new Ubuntu box, ran that script, and, uh, and substituted that. Um, I'm yet to see any differing results. Um, but like I said, everything is so script, everybody's scanning the internet um, all day, every day, and then as soon as they get into a box, they're, so their scan is scripted and then they get into a box and the execution of the commands is all scripted too. They don't even bother with the file system mostly. Um, and uh, I'll definitely blog about that as well. So, so here's my box in Europe. Um, login attempts versus successes in the past 30 days. I think I stood this one up like a, a little bit less than 30 days ago, so that's why you don't see data right there at the very beginning. Um, it has had 4,209 um, uh, login attempts and zero successes. It's because I'm running, um, it's an eight character password um, and it's been, um, and it, yeah, it's yet to be cracked. This is in the heart of, of Europe. Um, it it uh, is my most attacked box, but, do, but I, the buddies that I'm doing research with, they have a ton of boxes in Asia and it's not attacked as much as, as those boxes are. Um, and just, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a slide about this at the end, but this particular one is uh, timeforvps.eu, and I just paid nine euros, uh, ten euros, which right now the euro is super low, so it's a good deal. Um, and I got that for a whole year. Um, and uh, and because it's in because it's in uh, in in Europe, I put the login banner in Spanish because I speak Spanish, and I just wanted to see if there was any any correlation. I don't know how I measure that, but it's being having fun, you know? So, um, so this is what a typical malicious session looks like. Um, usually they hop in, they wget and curl some, some script or executable, they chmod it, um, execute it, and delete it. 99% of the time this is all scripted. You can see these attacks, um, wget dash c, and then it downloads that script, that 1818 script, chmods it, and then runs it. This particular guy didn't try and delete it but usually they will, um, and then they hop off. That's all they do. And it's like a lot of the time that it's like some uh, malicious uh, binary um, or a ton of the time it's just an IRC bot that they're trying to execute and, and, and recruit for their botnet, um, which is fun actually. Um, I, le I learned this tactic from a coworker who's actually in the room um, to analyze the uh, IRC um, to see what, what, what server they're logging into via IRC and join that chat room and see what's going on in the chat room. Um, that's a lot of fun. Sometimes you could even find the guy that's running it. Um, and I had, a, I had a friend who actually, he, uh, he logged into the, the IRC server. He found the guy um, that was running the botnet and he convinced him to like shut it down. It, it was a really interesting experience. Apparently he's super persuasive over IRC. <laughs> He's a, really, he's a good friend, I, I like him a lot. Occasionally you'll get a whole lot more commands, um, and uh, like this, these are, the, this particular session there was over 100 commands, um, and that's just a list of 20 right there. Still, still malicious. Um, this is a typical detection. If they don't detect it before they log in, they'll usually cat something like proc CPU info, which is also static, or they'll do a ps-a UX, or they'll do um, uname dash r is actually probably the most common one that I see. Um, sees that it's the default Kippo content and then they will hop out. So Kippo visual, visualization, um, the old and the new. Um, you guys that have deployed Kippo before, what are you guys using for, using for visualization? Are you using Kippo graph? Yeah? Anybody not using, excuse me, anybody not using Kippo graph? No? Um, anybody ever used um, MHN? No? I don't have any experience with that. 
Um, anyway, this is this is a this is a, a Kipple graph just runs uh, an HTTP server on the same box um, as your Kipple honeypot, and it graphs the stats for you. It's just a, some HTML thrown together, um, and this this is cool. this is my favorite thing about Kipple graph is that it will actually play back the entire session for you in real time and type it out. Like, it, and it will even, um, like if they pause for a minute in the middle of typing, then it will, and then, and then pick it back up, it will wait for as long as they pause, right? And it, it's funny to see, it's funny to see the scripted ones that are just running like 100 commands, and like it's coming up with all these errors because Kippo doesn't know that command, <laughs> but it's just still going. It's like, yeah, this is a script. <laughs> Um, that's just an example of the graph that Kippo will give you. Um, how many of you guys have seen this app, Tango Honeypot Intelligence? It's really new. Has anybody seen it? No? So, I'm sorry, his name kind of uh, got wrapped around on the other line, but Brian Wareheim, a uh, co-worker of mine, really good friend, um, he, uh, he developed this, and um, he just released it, I think, last week, and then this official page for, um, it's a Splunk app. He submitted it to Splunk and Splunk accepted, accepted it and that, um, that page um, just went up I think like three or four days ago. Um, and Tango Honeypot Intelligence is awesome. How many of you guys have ever used Splunk? Yeah, so you guys all know how powerful it is, right? So imagine if you have all your honeypots feeding into Splunk and you could parse through that data with Splunk and look at anything you want, graph anything you want. It's super awesome, super, super awesome. Um, it's demo time. Um, you expect the demo to work perfectly. What did, I, what did I say? You're gonna have a bad time. Let's see, so let's see if I can connect to the internet. If I can't, I recorded it, just in case. Doesn't look like I can, I'm not even getting anything. Anyway, so that is exactly why I recorded it. Give me a second here. Okay. You gotta be freaking kidding me. Oh, 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 I know why. Wrong app, wrong app. Here we go. Woo! I knew the demo gods were not gonna like me today. So this is, this, so, hold on, before, before it starts playing. Um, basically, like I said, uh, Tango, uh, it's still gone. Anyway, Tango Honeypot Intelligence, will, um, you, set, you, you install the Splunk forwarder on your honeypot, it forwards all the logs to your Splunk instance and Splunk indexes them. And uh, Brian has created a ton of apps, uh, a ton of dashboards, I'm sorry, um, to illustrate the type of stuff you're seeing. You'll see you got a daily overview, um, you got successful logins, failed logins, login attempts versus successes, log latest successful logins, attackers logging into multiple sensors, there were no instances of that. That's why it's showing no results. Um, he's got the session play log. He doesn't have the capability. He doesn't have the capability that Kipograph does of actually being able to play it back for you in real time. But as long as I can see the commands, I personally don't really care. Um, so you'll see it gives a, a session ID to each session. So you could you could search in Splunk for that session ID and bring up everything that that had to do with that session. It has the attacker IP, the sensor that it hit, um, the message count. Message count is how many commands were run in that session. Um, and then in this dashboard, you could also go in and, and select the HPLAO2. That's, my, that's uh, one of my honeypots. Um, and it pulls up all the sessions that it saw. And you see that last 12 hours that it's pulling up all the sessions that it saw for that honeypot in that um, particular time frame. Um, it shows you when the session time started, shows you the end time, shows you the durations, shows you the passwords accepted, if any more passwords were attempted. See, no, no other passwords were attempted by one except for one, two, three, four, five, six, obviously a honeypot, right? Maybe. Um, and this guy just, he did, he echoed, ls and then he just logged out. Um, did he download anything? No, he just catted the known host, which I believe is also static. Um, so let's go look at the attacker profile now. Um, any questions about the app so far? No, okay. This is its first demo, so you guys are. I was I was a big part of the of the testing of it before he actually submitted it. So um, let's see. So I'm go I, I'm going back to grab an IP because I need to provide 
that dashboard with an IT, IP of, a, of an attacker here. So I'm just going to copy and paste it here, and then and we'll see the uh, the results. You know, um, I think your honeypot pushes it, um, but I'm not 100% sure. It very well could be polling. Um, I could ask Brian. <laughs> Let me call him up. Just kidding. Um, if you, but if you hit me up like on IRC or Twitter on Monday, I can answer that question for you. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw, but it pu it pulled up the set all the sessions that that particular attacker had done in that time frame. It shows you where the attack was coming from, um, and and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so here I think I'm grabbing a session ID for the next dashboard or an IP. Oh, I'm grabbing a Chinese IP because we all know that what Chinese are all malicious when it comes to, to this stuff, right? Everything is China if you're mainly. No sympathy left. Oh yeah, I'm bringing up a one that I thought may have. I'm just showing you that it will show, it'll bring up different IP addresses. I was hoping that that guy had multiple attacks that it would show you and whatnot. Um, oh, and it, oh yeah, right there at the bottom, it'll show the files downloaded, um, and it'll give you the SHA-256 hash of that file. Um, and coming up here, uh, he actually has a dashboard that will go out and call the virus total API and submit that hash to virus total. And, and uh, then it will tell you if it's been seen by anybody else or not. Pretty cool. Um, so this is session analysis, human, it, it, human versus bot identification. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what he does to determine that, but I could definitely ask him if anyone's curious. Those are rare commands entered during the session that we don't see very often. Obviously, that, the executable of that 1818, I think that was the only time that I think it was only downloaded onto one honeypot. Um, so. so we're going to, so this is just gonna show you the top countries with login, top countries with scanning. So look at, look at the top countries scanning. Am I not right? Everything is China. So anyway, I'm gonna pause this video and go to the next one, um, if you guys don't mind. Here. This one's a little shorter. This is going through the file analysis that I was just telling you about that will call out to the virus total. So I'm, pull, so I'm pulling up all the latest file downloads from the past seven days. Um, just waiting for the data to populate here. And those are all the files that were downloaded in the last seven days. Keep in mind, this is only monitoring five honeypots. Um, in our environment where we have 40 feeding into our smoke environment, you'd see a whole lot more. Um, and it, it's got the SHA-256 hash, um, the attacker IP, the sensor that it was downloaded onto, the session ID, um, and then you'll see this drop-down window, it auto-fills with all the SHA-256 hashes, and then you'll, this particular hash, it's going out to virus total, and you'll see um, all those vendor signatures, it's been submitted to virus total before. So it's not unique, it's been seen before. Um, however, this one that I'm pulling up right now has not. You'll see the vendor signatures unknown. It's, uh, that was not submitted to virus total before, which is pretty cool. Uh, but it's probably just a variant of some other piece of malware or something. Um, top 10 malware signatures you've seen over time. He's pulling that from, from virus total, I believe. Um, uh, legitimate malware scene, I'm not super familiar with what he's trying to do there. Um, potential malware files, the ones that result, didn't result, uh, didn't come back with any results from virus total. Um, then we got malware campaigns. That, this doesn't come up with anything. Um, it, 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 he looks at the URLs, if they're coming from the same URLs, if it's the same type of campaign, uh, same type of um, malware, the same, basically the same script, just different name or whatever, where they're coming from. He's trying to aggregate data. Um, and this is obviously a lot more useful if you have more than five honeypots feeding into it, right? So, let's see. Then, what about time? Yeah, like I said, so I'm 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 uh, participating in with a bunch of buddies. And we're doing a lot of research right now, and um, there's probably about 
I think 15 of us are actually feeding honeypots into one Splunk app, and I think we have about 40 honeypots. Um, and the data in there is freaking awesome. So um, uh, we're call, we're, we call ourselves Threat Incorporated, if you want to follow us on Twitter. And, and we're going to start publishing reports and stuff like that. Um, and then this one just goes over the network analysis, nothing super, super exciting. Um, it just shows you the top domain scene that the malware came from. Um, and same URI on multiple, um, on multiple domains, the last IP address is seen, whatnot. Any questions, any other questions about the app? So it's open source and it's free. I'd highly encourage you to go download it. If you, get, if you don't have any experience with uh, Splunk, there may be a little bit of a learning curve, but I would definitely recommend that you learn Splunk as well because it's becoming very, very popular in the industry. Um, so um, there's some downloads for you. There's the original Kippo, um, the Kippo fork that I use. Um, um, the Kippo fork that I use is maintained by Michael Oosterhoff, and he, um, as far as I know, he's, a, he's actually the only Kippo developer that's actively maintaining his fork. Um, and he, he supports SFTP and JSON logging. And so you, if you're going to use Tango, you, I, I believe you have to use his fork because Tango uses JSON logging. Um, and he updates it regularly. I think the last commit that he had was like three days ago. Um, download Tango right there. Download HoneyDrive. Um, and then here are my hosting links. I host at Krizik. Um, at Cloud at Cost, time for VPS. I find these deals at low end stock or lowendstock.com. Um, and yeah, I pay, I pay almost nothing for them. Some people that you probably want to follow if, um, if you want to get into the scene, Andrew Morris, I mentioned him, Brian Wareheim, Michael Oosterhoff, uh, DA667, I think I mentioned all these guys, and Thread Incorporated, like I said, is the group of us that are collaborating together. Um, that's my contact info. You can find me on Freenode under Chipin, Twitter under Chipin. My blog is bootspeen.org. Um, and uh, any questions? Yes, in the back. Oh, yeah. No, you, you, you go. Uh, I haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> I, I don't imagine so because, I mean, like I said, they're, they're scanning the internet anyway. Their IPs are going to get scanned anyway. And it's, if, if any data gets lost, it's, I hope they're doing a good enough job that it's only going to be my data, you know, but I don't have any sensitive data on there. Yes? Um, so the only interaction that I've had with other honey potters is mainly uh, independent researchers, and um, but I would imagine that there are enterprises that are doing that. Um, it sounds like a really really good idea. Um, so it would. So I personally have not known, but I um, but it sounds like a great idea. There was another question. No, any other questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, if they're downloading illegal content, um, yeah, I guess I could get in trouble. But, <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, I get, so they're obviously able to download, um, but they have to actually get, I'm sorry? No, but you can. Um, I'm not personally no, uh, but the fork of Kippo that I use does support SFTP, um, and so you can do that. That's a good question. Do you have a question? Does someone? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's like my that's my favorite part about honey potting, actually. Um, I didn't go super into it because I wanted to, I, I, not a lot of people here have used Honeypots and I figured that would be the case. Um, but I'm, uh, Andrew Morris, the guy that I pointed out here, um, he, he's really good at that. Um, well, a lot better than me anyway. And, he's, and he, me and him will go through a lot of malware together and we'll 
we'll, we'll just, he has an IDA Pro license and I'll usually just use a GDB. Um, and then we'll, we, may, we may even execute it in a, in a sandbox environment and run Wireshark and see where it's calling out to and, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so I, I, I've dabbled in it. Definitely not super good at it though. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.